Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. In her photo essay, A Life After Life in Prison, my friend Sarah Bennett follows four women as they return to the world after serving long terms in a maximum secured prison for women. A criminal justice attorney who's contested wrongful convictions and represented people in prison for almost 30 years, Sarah decided to use her photography skills as another way to show the need for reform of our criminal justice system, and she's my guest today. So welcome. Hi, Ronnie. This was a wonderful thing, Thank you. this booklet. It was so fun to do it. And it was a wonderful way of really showing these women that you come to know mm-hmm. so well, mm-hmm. right? I think so. So how did you start? You know, I always had this idea that we lock people away for a really long time because we don't really know who they are and we don't think about our prisoners, you know? And so I felt like if we could actually see who prisoners are, maybe we would treat them with a little more humanity. You know, I'm really bothered by the fact that we call it special housing unit instead of segregation. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, yeah, put people in in segregation and keep them there for 23 hours lockdown. I mean, who does that as a society? But if you start to look and see people like this, then you go, oh, that could be my mother, my sister, my daughter, my cousin, myself. (laughs) Myself then maybe we'll treat people a little better. So that's really the impetus for this I always, project. you know, I think I've told you, whenever I went to Bedford Hills for women, mm-hmm. the correctional facility for women, I always thought there, but for the grace of God goes I, because so many people are in there because of that one moment uh-huh. in their life when they lost control or something, and it became a moment they regretted for the rest of their right, life. Right, exactly. But it had such an impact on everybody. And everybody is so much more than that one moment, but the moment you become arrested, that's who you are forever. And I feel like it follows them forever. It follows them while they're in prison. It follows them when they try to get parole, and they can come back in front of the parole board 20 years later, and they're not saying, what have you done for these 20 years? It's, tell us about that act you did 20 years ago. And then they come outside, and they try to get a job, and it's the same thing you know, try to get housing, everything, and then they try to get off parole. So that one moment, it can be 20, 25. One of my women was in prison for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Which woman is that? That's Carol. Carol's the older woman. Oh, I know. And she, you know, she was in for 35 years. Mm. Her sentence was actually um, 25 years. This is Carol. Yeah. Which I just, I love this. Yeah. She lives in housing provided by our children which is really housing that was set up for women with children and usually people who had done short-term sentences. But the founder of our children, I think, realized that these women who are coming out after a long time, she would be in a homeless shelter if not for our children. So she's actually just, um, this is kind of her honorary grandchild, Cecil, (laughs) and she's just picking them up after daycare and having an amazing, amazing time. Now, she... She was in prison for how many years? 35. So she had a sentence of 25 to life. And then she kept on going to the parole board every two years. And every two years, she would be denied parole. And so you would think, well, what did she do while she was in prison, right? Actually, she was a supermodel inmate at Bedford. I think you know they have this housing called Mm -hmm. Fisk, which is... um, The Honor Cottage. An Honor Cottage. Well, she was one of the first residents of that Honor Cottage. Oh, so I must have met her. It opened in 1982, and she was in that honor cottage from 1982 all the way for the rest of her sentence until she, um, at a certain point after those 25 years, she would have been sent to a medium security mm-hmm. prison. But she wanted to stay there. No, she couldn't. Oh. They send them out to a oh. me- when, Once you're within a certain amount of time of your parole oh. date. And then she ended up back in Bedford because she had a couple of heart attacks, and she spent time in the, it's called the regional medical unit. It is, I think, every prisoner's scariest, um, you know, it's their biggest worry that they're going to spend the remaining days on the regional medical unit in the hospital, which is sort of like a prison within a prison. Now, all of the women in the book did commit murder or were present. Right. Well, they were all convicted of murder. Whether yeah, they that's actually, the way to say yeah, it. they were all convicted of murder. Because we do have different things, and I don't think people understand a felony murder mm-hmm. is what when you were present at a at murder. A, at a murder, right? Or you could be, um, you know, you could plead guilty to murder, but that doesn't mean that you were actually the person. Well, that could be the felony yeah. murder again. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could be somebody like Kayla, who. Um, was 20, and she was raped, and she killed her rapist 
two days after the rape occurred. This is Kayla. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes you wonder what a different defense may yes. have done for her, you know, a, somebody who had raised post-traumatic stress syndrome or something like that. But in but her days, she, also, how long was she in prison? She was in prison um, for 20 years. She was originally given a sentence of 25 to life, so um, I don't actually know that much about most of these women's mm -hmm. cases, but her case was reduced on appeal to 15 years, and then the parole board kept on denying her parole. And Why would they do that? Well, I think you've had people on this show before talking about parole, right? No, I mean, I never really, can understand. Well, it. the thing is, as you go up in front of the parole board, you have only a couple of minutes. These days, you don't even see the parole commissioners. It's done via video yeah, conferencing, so me. and they mostly just talk about the crime. And so they're talking what happened twenty years ago. I mean, I know the. New, do you know this that the New York Court of Appeals actually heard a parole appeal the other day because they have. Um, they have a new way that they're supposed to be evaluating. Yes, it's a whole chart. Is that it's right? A, the whole chart, system. Yeah, yeah, and a system. And they don't use it. And they don't use it. So I think they're going to start, um, That's well, a, we'll see what the court rules. It's different, but, different things to look for to judge whether a person has really changed, I guess. Exactly. What their attitude is. Right, yeah. exactly. Which would make it much easier than just starting with a repetition of what they did. Exactly. Right, so tell me about her. Well, Kayla, Kayla, uh, Kayla. is... Um, I mean, I love all these women. You yeah. know, I spent a lot of time with them, and I've really gotten to know them. Um, I, this photo is the first day that I met Kayla. So she had been out of prison for, I think, two and a half weeks or three weeks. And I called her. I knew she had gotten out from my client, Judy Clark, who had told me about her. And I called her, and I said, I'm doing this photography project. Would you be interested? And she was like, sure. <laughs> so I met her in Penn Station. And we didn't know each other. And can you imagine? Mm -mm. And so this was her first time on the subway and in Penn Station in 20 years. It took me a little bit of time to find her at Penn Station. When I found her, I had an orange backpack and a red umbrella, and I said, <laughs> look for me. She just fell into my arms trembling. She was so completely overwhelmed by that experience. And, you know, in 20 years, everything's changed. The way the metro, you know, there was a mm -hmm. token, not a metro card. You put a quarter in the phone mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, I mean, just... They had no access to cell phones. They, they're not allowed no to use... No computer. The, no computers. They're not allowed to use the Internet. So it was really... Um, I met her. We rode the subway together, which is the subway mm -hmm. photo. And then I went to a meeting of former women prisoners with her. And I went in, and there were probably maybe about 14 or 15 women there. And I said, I'm taking these photos. Does anybody else... Well, actually, I wasn't looking for participants, yeah. and then everyone was like, can I participate? Can I participate? <laughs> so I told them they had to have had a life sentence on the end. Mm -hmm. um, right, so you know, because that means it's an indeterminate time, even though yeah, it's 15 to life. Life, right, because you, you can have eligible. 25 to life and serve 35 yeah. so years. So you're not you eligible for parole to your 50, serve Exactly, 50. Okay. and so that's where yeah. I found some of my other... Um, right. Now, where clients. does Kayla live? Uh, Kayla lives in um, Astoria. She lives. Um, she has a girlfriend now, so she's in a kind of a established relationship, and she works in a corporate kitchen. And she's, I mean, she's only been out for a year. I think I have the portrait of her on her one year anniversary, mm -hmm. and it's just so funny. She's stylish and mm -hmm. she's so happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like life is easy. Life mm -hmm. is difficult. Housing mm -hmm. is difficult. Finding a job is difficult. But mm -hmm. um, she's only forty, and I think the transition at 40 is a lot easier, easier than, than it is at 65. Right, right. So well, this woman is 49. Tracy has um, a lot of family support, but she doesn't have any kind of institutional support. That's what the way I would say it. She's not plugged into any of those programs like Providence House or Our Children or the Fortune Society or anything like that. So to um, get plugged into one of those is your own initiative? No, not Does the parole officer suggest it? No, usually when you're, when you're paroled, they ask you where you're going to go to. And sometimes you've already made a, um, you've formed a relationship with one of these organizations. I mean, she actually started out at Providence House, which, as yeah. you know, was founded yeah. by Sister Elaine Roulette. Yeah. And she spent four months there, but that's only how long you're allowed to spend there. I love the picture of her doing her hair. Well, this is... <laughs> This, pro this really spoke to me because when people come out of prison, they're required to go to all these kind of state-mandated programs. So her crime was because she was um, 
a cocaine and alcohol. She had cocaine and alcohol addiction, so she has to go to counseling for cocaine and alcohol, and she had to go to parole, and she had to go to some other kind of counseling, and I think she had to see a therapist. So this is actually on the way for her to see her social worker, and you can notice it's two o'clock in the afternoon, and there's nobody there, and you know there's. I don't know how many millions of dollars are being funneled into these programs that are supposed to be helping people. And it just seems like it would be so much better to help people with housing and money and mm -hmm. housing and jobs and things like that. But yeah, she, this is, she's only been out a few months and she's really got her phone and her style. And, and she's everything. lucky though to be working at Burger King. Lucky. <laughs> she felt lucky at Burger King. I mean, can you imagine you're 49 years old? I mean, these women are all, this is a story of poverty also, really, right? Mm -hmm. She's working the night shift because mm -hmm. she has to go to so many programs and she can't be late to her programs. And so, so how long does she have to go to the programs? For six months. And she worked at Burger King, I think, for four. And as soon as she didn't have to go to those state mandated programs, she left the job at Burger King. because Did it she was, get another job? Well, she worked as Sal at Salvation Army as a bell ringer over the Christmas vacation. And Look at her standing there. Yeah. You know, I never actually realized that was a paid job. Yeah. Did you? No. I always thought they were volunteers. Yeah. So, and you know, this, when she went to Salvation Army, they, um, um, they told her she could have the job, and then they did a background check on her and found out that she had a felony conviction. And the day she showed up for work, they said, you can't have this job. So she... Um, this is the Salvation Army. Salvation Army. So she called me and she was crying. Mm. And I said, Tracy, you know, they said they really liked you. Why don't you go back there and say, you know, you liked me and you're an organization that's supposed to help poor people. If you won't help me, who will? And so she did and she got the job. Oh, great. And it was very empowering. That's so great. Yeah. For her. It was really great. Absolutely. She has a grandchild. She, when she went to prison, she had three very young children. And... This is really interesting, but if you're out of state, you're entitled to more trailer visits than if you're in state. What does that mean? What do you mean? So if you have children or family in, oh, in come Bedford, from New Jersey, you, you are allowed twice a year trailer visits oh. with a loved one. But when you're out of state, I think you're allowed them once a month. Oh, isn't that sensitive? So because she was from New Jersey, and it was actually pretty close to Bedford, yeah. closer than people coming yeah. from Brooklyn or Queens, right. um, she saw her children every month. Mm. for 20 something oh years. They goodness. basically grew up in prison and then they started bringing grandchildren. Oh. So that's why I say she has a very tight knit yeah. right. family. Support. And yeah. they, live, they all live in New Jersey. Right. And then we come to, is this another page? Yeah, yeah this is, uh, these are all Tracy. Oh, I yes, see. Okay. This, is all, this is all Tracy. Look at that face. Yeah. So you can see she's starting to yeah. struggle more. Like yeah. you see ups and downs yeah. with yeah. these women. Does she, oh, she's now in a friend's apartment? Yes, yeah, she is. Here she was in one of those three-quarter houses mm. oh, that you've read that about. That we hear about, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then who else do we have? We, we have Evelyn. Oh, uh, we have Evelyn. Was Carol as heavy as this when she first went to prison? I doubt it. She would have been a young woman when yeah. she went to prison. Yeah. And hers, in some ways, is a story of, you know, being ill and having heart disease. and mm. Horrible. And still being in prison and being and, a model prisoner. Right. So and why then, was she in... I, well, we'll go back to that another okay. time. I mean, I can't believe that she was, and now we have Evelyn. Now we have Evelyn. You know I love all these women, yeah. but um, <laughs> Evelyn is just one of the most joyous, um, outgoing, you know, she just takes, takes life and goes with it. And so it's just really been fabulous to watch her. So she really did come out into the real world. With yeah, she gusto did. And, and she, she did. And she got some training and she found a job in a corporate kitchen and she found the job herself. She didn't actually find it through mm -hmm. anybody else. And she was promoted in within 10 months from mm. blind chef to sous chef, which is pretty unheard of in that business. Did she cook so, in Med Bedford Hills? Yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she did. So that was lucky. She at least got some kind of well, you know, they, experience. they all have skills. Yeah. That's the thing. Every single one of them has some kind of skills, whether it's culinary or, you know, painting, plastering, sanding floors, plumbing, electri electricians. I mean, they all have skills. So is there anybody in the prison that can direct them when they get out? No. To where they can go? No. So that's a break. So in a person's progress. It's a big break when you come out. You, I think you still come out with that $40. Yeah. $40, a bus ticket to New York. Yeah. And if you don't have housing, I think you go straight into the shelter system. So it's just really... It's a terrible yeah. system. It's a terrible I'm system. I'm here at people who have spent at least 15 years in prison, 15 mm -hmm. to life. 
or even more, hopefully they have done what you hope prison accomplishes. I'm not even talking about uh -huh. the length of the sentence, right. uh -huh. but that they've come to terms with themselves mm -hmm. and they better understand themselves, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's called rehabilitation, which I hate that expression. Uh -huh. Just uh -huh. hate it. Uh, and they come out and they're just dumped, basically. Basically. Except they have a parole officer. Right. For whom they, services they have to pay. Yes, they do. That is the most <laughs> incredible thing. Yeah. Tell me about that. <laughs> so when you're on parole, in the beginning you report, I think, sometimes every two weeks or every month, and then it becomes more extended. But if you have a job, you pay. So Evelyn pays $30 a month to go see her parole officer, who I think she has to see every four months, who, you know, I'm not going to fault a, an individual parole officer because it's the system. <clears throat> and they have a lot of people. They have a lot of people, and there's a lot of requirements. You have to give urine samples every time you come in. <clears throat> they have curfews. So her curfew is, I think, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So she had to get several, um, special permission to go to her job because her job starts at 6.30 in the morning. So she has to get up at 5 in the morning to get to her job on time. She was just denied release from parole. Are there reasons <clears throat> given? No, no reasons. It's completely arbitrary. I was actually really upset for her. She's just done everything right. She's been out for three years. She's worked really hard. She's found housing. She's never been in trouble. I mean, she's just amazing. And so maybe parole su supervision is needed for some people, but certainly not somebody. Who's found a job, who has a good job, who ha right. who's been promoted. Right. And so to tack on like another requirement to her that that she has to go at the end of her long work day to p report in with a parole officer to get permission every time she wants to leave the five boroughs. Um, if she gets a weekend job, but she often does catering, she has to get permission. Um, we recently, I recently had this exhibit at SUNY Purchase, and the women were invited by the college to come and be part of the panel discussion, had to get permission from her parole officer to go. So there's just a lot of requirements. And pay $30. And pay for $30. And, you know, even though, I mean, you may not know, I didn't really know this, but uh, cooking is a very low-paid job, actually, even as a sous mm -hmm. chef. So that $30, I mean, every dollar of course. is important. Yeah. So They don't make a lot of money, and no. then they have to ride the subways and everything else. And there's Sister Elaine, yeah. who Ooh. used to be at Bedford Hills full time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And she's known for her nursery work and for all her love and everything. Where does she live, Evelyn? Evelyn lives in Flushing. So so she lives in housing with um, six other women. Yeah. So we have to, we've come to the end of our oh. stories. Let's <laughs> summarize, though, quickly. Okay. These lovely pictures uh -huh. and this, these relationships you've established mm -hmm. with these women make it even more poignant and difficult, doesn't it, to understand the system? You know, Ronnie, I could never understand the system. I just don't understand why we throw away people for so long in this country, which, you know, at this point, the U.S. incarcerates at greater levels and for longer times than any other Western country. It's just, you know, these women could have spent five years in or eight years or, you know, mm -hmm. some of them probably didn't deserve any time at all. Mm -hmm. But I always, I always had this idea that around year eight, people should get to go back because it takes a few years to settle into prison and come to terms with what you've done, you know, to accept that you're going to be there. A few more years to, like, really start to work on yourself. By year eight, you're, like, established in prison. So why not set up something at year eight or nine or ten or something and let people be reevaluated and decide, are they ready to come back into society? And then... People who serve long terms have the lowest recidivism rate of anybody. Well, sure, they're older for yeah, one thing, yeah. you know, and they're not, they're not going back. I mean, that's all these women tell me, no matter what. I'm, they follow every rule to the T, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's, so it's, um, it's very difficult to uh, understand. It's harder, though, to change. So how do we mm. change? How do we change the whole society? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's almost like you have to start from scratch. You have to understand like people and their experiences and their circumstances, and not be such an adversarial system from day mm -hmm. one. So that at the moment that somebody does something and they're arrested, let's step back for a while and evaluate who they are, where they've come from, what kind of support do they have? Do they actually really belong in the system, or do they need something else? You know, but we're not set up like that. 
So I would start from the beginning and work my way. But when you get into prison, then <clears throat> certainly we need the parole changes and everything else. So um, this is up. This exhibit is up at SUNY Purchase. It is. It's at SUNY Purchase until November eighteenth. And are you going to do a sequel? Um, I'm going to. I have something I call the Bedroom Project, where I've been photographing also former lifers in their home setting. So I'm going to continue with that. These women, for sure, I want to continue to follow them and see mm. where they go. Obviously, they're a little more established, so there's mm. fewer opportunities to see the change. But yeah, I plan to. Stay and to it. follow somebody the minute they walk out those doors. I'm waiting for somebody to get them, somebody <laughs> yeah. at that moment. Did you hear stories about what their life was like when they were in prison? I learned so much about prison. I thought I knew mm -hmm. a lot, you know, because I've been in and out of Bedford for a long, long time. Um, one time, I, when I first started, I used to ask them all kind of the same question, like, did you bring anything home from prison? I wanted to know, like, what was meaningful to them. So Kayla brought home a baseball mitt. And she told me how she paid, played baseball in prison, which I didn't even know they had baseball teams. Yeah. Back in the day, they used to play the guards. Yeah. It was really Isn't great. That something? Yeah. yeah. And then she what told do you me mean back in the day. Well, they I don't think they, I don't think they do it anymore. They, Bedford doesn't have nearly the amount of um, freedom. Ingenious you know, it, no, no, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, but anyway, her father had given her that baseball mitt, and her father died while she was in prison. So she started telling me about what it's like to find out when somebody dies in prison. You know, she said, you know, you're called down to, you have a phone call and um, a religious person comes with you. So you know somebody has died. And she was expecting it to be her grandmother, but her grandfather, I mean, her father had died of a heart attack. So then she went to his funeral, which I didn't even know that people did that. But she described being shackled for 20 hours to get down to the funeral home and to get back and did they remove what, the shackles when she went in no and what the whole trip was like and she got to the funeral home and no, nobody from her family was there yet and the officers wanted her to go in and see her father by herself and she didn't feel emotionally equipped to do that and she said she started screaming at them and crying and you know she was basically having a breakdown and it was just it was so sad and so like it's just it really got me like I feel like you can see that when yeah. she's talking about it, but it really got me because um, and then most of the women told me they had similar experiences of going to either to a deathbed or to a funeral and it's the shackling and the lack of compassion from the people who are transporting you is just really really terrible what else did you learn but, uh, what's it like aging in prison? I mean, well, Carol, I really learned a lot about that because she had two heart attacks. So she was went from being in Fisk, which was a wonderful housing, to a medium security, which was okay too, back to Bedford in the as I was saying before the regional medical unit, which is housing. I mean, the hospital, and it's it's separated from the rest of the prison, and you're you don't go out when you're there, and. You can't get visitors. You can get outside visitors, but Carol never had an outside visitor, I don't think, in her 35 years. I think her son came once. And so prisoners can, only, prisoners can come and see you, but they can't come during their programming. And visiting hours are during programming. So they say you can have a visitor, but, but you, you cannot. Can. And she said you can sit on a screened-in porch, and you can, but you're not allowed to holler. Is what the word she used, and allowed to holler. So you can kind of see people in the distance and wave yeah. to them. It's very, very, very isolating. Mm -hmm. The food is supposed to be terrible. The medical staff, some are, some are nice, of course, and some are not. It's just, you know, it's just kind of like a slow, slow, isolated death and dying. It's everybody's biggest fear. Did they comment about um, the difference in the administration? Um, I mean, if they were there long enough, they were there, you know, for instance, when Elaine Lord was the superintendent. Most of them were there when Elaine Lord was the superintendent, where they had a lot of things going on, mm -hmm. baseball games, and they ran programs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sister, I mean, Elaine Lord's idea was, is people go to prison, that's the punishment, being as isolated from society. Once you're here, let's live the fullest life you can. <clears throat> I don't think that's really the trend in New York State Department of Corrections anymore. And I think she was kind of different. Um, most of them didn't spend that much time under other 
um, uh, superintendents because when you're within five years of your parole date, you usually get shipped out to a medium security. Oh, really? Or I minimum, didn't realize yeah. That. yeah. So you get shipped out. Do you get notice when you're going to be shipped out? Not usually. So you've lived in a place. Yeah. You're you're established. You have your, your friends. Room your room has your things yeah. up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about a room, but there's still yeah. a gate that comes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they come and tell you to pack? I think that's pretty much how it goes, yeah. It's the same way they tell you to pack when you're going to home, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember once uh, a woman who was released had nobody in New York. She came from upstate. She arrives in New York in a snowstorm. I'll never forget this. She had open toe slingback shoes uh -huh. on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just an incredible kind of life. So there's so much talk about prison reform. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Is it ever going to move from the drug sentencing down to the population we're talking about? I hope so. Yeah. I really hope so. That's what needs to be done, right? It has to be done. But the more we talk about the low-level offenders, the more we're isolating the, the violent we're offenders. We're forgetting. Well, yeah, we're forgetting them, or we're kind of putting them over here as other, but that's really who's in prison. Yeah. You know, and so that's the heart so of it. it makes me worried when I mean, I was happy Obama went to prison. But when he said the thing about I'm not talking about the robbers and the murderers, he should be talking about the people convicted of robbery and murder, because those are the long termers. Those are the people with those. Those are the people we're supposedly rehabilitating. And they ha in New York, they have life without parole. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. That's a, a very expensive. Um, right. All system. the money could come from improving other things outside. Yeah. 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 So we've come to the end of the program. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.